This is Burlington, and here we are in the CCTV Channel 17 newsroom, and uh, the ongoing conversation is called the Nuclear Free Future Conversation. And viewers, I'd like you to welcome with me our guests, Maggie Gunderson, the, the uh, president and founder of Fairwinds Energy Education Associates. And next to her is Arnie Gunderson, the chief engineer for Fairwinds Energy Education Associates. And our guest today is Mark Pendergra Pendergrast who is the author of a, uh, a book called Japan's Tipping Point, Crucial Choices in the Post-Fukushima World. And we have set ourselves the topic question today, does Japan have a nuclear free future? And this past weekend, something monumental, earth shattering has happened. And that is... Well, Japan has had... Um um, a nuclear power plant operating in one form or, or another for the last 50 years, the last five decades. And uh, for the first time in five decades this weekend, no nuclear plants are running in Japan. 54 nuclear plants are now uh, shut down. The, um, obviously, there's the ones at Fukushima. But the Fukushima fallout, uh, the political fallout, not the radiation fallout, um, has uh, has caused each individual state that has nuclear power plants to um, uh, to refuse to allow those plants to start back up. So this isn't like Vermont, where the, the federal government has the final authority. In Japan, when a plant shuts back down, it has to have permission from the state to start back up, and nobody's given permission now. And when this last nuclear power plant was closed down, was it closed uh, down for? Uh, a particular reason? No, they've all been shut down. Um, as they run out of fuel, and they need to be refueled, they shut down. Um, but then the, the, the state governors are not allowing them to start back up. So ordinarily, before the Fukushima disaster, this would have been a routine process, right? Yeah, there's f uh, 54 plants in Japan, yeah. and um, uh, that makes 35% of their power. Um, now, some are always shut down, but uh, um, yeah, this, this was routine. They would uh, um, shut down for refueling, ask permission, and it was always given. But the problem is now they're not restarting any of them. <laughs> yes. So we, for them, that's we perhaps problem. have reached what you call Japan's tipping point. Well, I hope that they realize they've reached a tipping point. Right now, I'm afraid that they haven't really come to grips with what are we going to do. It's clear that the people of Japan are not comfortable relying on nuclear power, and that's why none of them are working at the moment. The government hasn't figured that out. Is that right, Arnie? I would agree with that, too. I, w I would agree with that. I read your book, and I thought it was so interesting that uh, there were particular quotes from particular people within the government who aren't looking at any new paradigm. And yet all the viewers from Japan who write to us, call us, and um, I've met a number of people in, in the United States also who have come from Japan to visit or, or immigrate here, and, and they're clear. They don't want any more nuclear power. And um, yet the government does not seem to be looking at some of the renewable resources that you looked at when you were in Japan. Well, I don't think that they are looking at them all that seriously. They did pass a feed-in tariff bill, which will begin to actually kick in in July of this summer. What, what is this feed-in tariff? We have one here in Vermont, actually. We were the first state to have it. It's basically a subsidy for forms of renewable energy. And the history of this for renewable uh, energy in Japan is that they had a subsidy only for photovoltaic panels, for solar panels, up until 2005, at which time they were by far the dominant uh, country producing and utilizing uh, solar energy. They decided, well, we've had enough of that. We, we don't need to subsidize it anymore. Uh, and they stopped in 2005. By 2009, when they began to do it again, they were like making 10% of uh, Germany 
and China and the United States had far surpassed them in, in uh, solar panel production. So they finally uh, passed legislation to subsidize all forms of renewable energy, uh, wind, geothermal, um, a, a variety of, of sources, um, as of July. But it's very unclear as to whether TEPCO and the other electric utilities, the monopolies, there are 10 of them in Japan, are really going to let them uh, accept a lot of, of uh, renewable energy into their grid. Um, so it remains to be seen whether this is going to have a, a, a big impact or not. Well, one of the things you pointed out in your book, and Arnie has spoken about also, is the way the grid works in Japan. And, and, and it doesn't allow for um, any movement of electricity in the way we do it in, in the U.S. Could one of you speak to that? Well, east to west, there's a, a phase difference. One side of the island's on 60 cycles, one side's on 50 cycles. So it's hard to get the east and the west to communicate. But, but as Mark said, these are monopolies. And uh, they really don't want to share um, interconnections between the grid to have a full national grid. Um, on an island the size of Japan, it's so eminently doable. But yet, because they have 10... Uh, very powerful monopolies, it doesn't get done. So we're not talking about a local control of the grid at all. Or a government control. Or a, gov or a government control. It's, right. it's, the, it's the, again, a monopoly as, as also known as a corporation. Is that what it is? Well, there's okay. also this, uh, there's sort of a, it's, it's kind of like in the United States, only worse. The people from uh, the electric monopolies when they retire, then they go to become, you know, in the uh, the Ministry of uh, Industry, uh, and vice versa. So there's this sort of revolving door. They're all tied together, running the country, and they don't like renewable energy because renewable energy, such as wind, or it only works when the wind is going. If there's too much wind, it's a problem. If there's not enough wind, it's a problem. They don't like sun because sometimes the sun is not out. So. They prefer nice, reliable baseline energy, which I understand, but as a matter of fact, they need to figure out how to take renewable energy into their grid. And uh, the big problem is storage. Electricity, you can't store huge amounts of it. So it's a challenge, but they need to, you know, I said that they were like the canary in the coal mine for the rest of the world. It's so clear, so clear in Japan that they have enormous opportunity to show the rest of the world how this can be done. Uh, and they have no fossil fuel of their own. Uh, so they're not going to use nuclear. This is the tipping point for the world only a little bit early, and we're seeing it in Japan. So they have enormous uh, geothermal potential. They have great wind potential, although it's challenging where they are. Um, they could use different kinds of geothermal. There's closed loop systems. Um, there are many things that they could possibly do. They could certainly use, they have a lot of wood. They have a, a mono culture of uh, cedar, which is uh, causing everybody to be allergic. <laughs> yeah. And they have these masks that they wear. You know, those cedar trees were not there before World War II. They imported those mm -hmm. after the war. They wanted this more of a Western cultural look and, and spread those all over. And well, there was another reason, right? Were you just getting to that, Mark, about why they planted the cedar trees? Well, they had this idea that it was going to, that they were going to have very cheap lumber. The, the Japanese cedar grow very quickly. It didn't turn out to be the case. They imported all this lumber. So now, let me tell you one of the things that I found astonishing here. This is just, just a story of, of uh, the wood pellet factories. Uh, on the face of it, it would make sense that, you know, they would uh, turn uh, the wood into wood pellets to, to heat their homes. So the government has subsidized over a hundred wood pellet plants, and I saw one of them in a very rural area. But it doesn't make any lo logical sense. Logic often has nothing to do with what they're, they're doing. Because 
they don't have a lumber industry to speak of, so they don't make very much sawdust. So instead of making wood stoves, such as we have here in Vermont, which would make a lot of sense to, to burn their wood, they are turning it into first, uh, they're, they're turning it into sawdust artificially. And how they're doing that? With a lot of fossil fuel. They're dragging it off the mountains, turning it into sawdust, compressing it with more fossil fuel, and then they're trying to sell it, only nobody's buying the wood pellet stoves because they cost a fortune and they're made in Germany. So very few people, so they, they have these plants that are working at half capacity and don't have any market rather than to produce efficient but cheap wood stoves that you could use in your home. So it, a lot of what they do doesn't make any sense. Well, this is a fascinating book, and uh, you were there uh, uh, for our viewers' uh, you, uh, information. You were there for six weeks, and you, you kept focused on the, the clean energy issue yeah, there. I, I got a, a grant to go there. Uh, it just happened that uh, I was appearing there two months to the day after the tsunami uh, or the earthquake and the uh, nuclear meltdown. So it couldn't have been better timing for me in terms of what I was looking at, which was uh, their, quote, eco-model cities program and all of the different forms of renewable energy. And it was very clear to me that they were not forging ahead the way that I had thought they would be. I, I went over there quite naive. I thought, oh, they must be doing all these wonderful things because they know they don't have any fossil fuel. And, but it turns out that they, had been, they were relying very much on nuclear power. Uh, and then suddenly they didn't know what they were going to do. And I don't think they have figured out what they're doing. And you went at a time that was really good because um, the food chain wasn't yet contaminated like it is now. You were eating last year's rice crop, last year's green tea, mm. um, you know, last year's vegetables because they're showing inordinate amounts of contamination from radioactivity in food throughout the country now. It's frightening. It is frightening. What did you eat when you were there? Um, only food from southern Japan and uh, south of Tokyo, and also uh, some from Australia. Uh, I wouldn't eat northern Japanese mm -hmm. food. No. Well, I was fortunate in that my itinerary was all south of, of Tokyo. Uh, it was, just happened that that's what I had planned to do, so that's where I went to. You're very lucky. Yeah, and Arnie, could you just remind us on your website on Fairwinds, you had something about the soil, the contamination of the soil from Fukushima. Yeah. The latest on that. Could you just tell us what that is, please? Well, I went to I went to Tokyo back in February, and took some soil samples. Um, one a day for the five days I was there, in no particular locations that um, stood out. You know, crack in the sidewalk right across from the Supreme Court. Um, and then uh, had those all sampled at a lab here in the United States, brought them back through customs and declared them as uh, radioactive dirt and brought them through. And the lab here determined that uh, all of them would be treated as radioactive waste if it had been in the United States. You know, it's, it's interesting because um, um, in the United States, we haven't even blinked after Fukushima. We continue to operate all our nuclear plants, but um, uh, I tried to bring the message home on the website about that issue. Um, here's Tokyo, the capital of, of, of Japan, um, about 150 miles away from the, the reactor. And its dirt is contaminated as if it were radioactive waste. Now, outside of Washington, D.C., there's uh, about a dozen nuclear reactors within 100 miles. And yet we seem to think it can't happen here. Um, but, in fact, it could. You know, that was the point I was trying to make when, uh, when we put that video up on the website. Can I talk to the, the, the fuel cycle for a minute? Then? Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did Japan get into this? You know, Mark said they, they don't have oil, they don't have coal, and they don't have uranium. But they bought into the concept of a nuclear fuel cycle, which meant they would buy uranium somewhere, but then they would never have to buy it again because they believed that once they used it in their nuclear reactors, they could reprocess it, run it through a thing called a breeder reactor, and actually create more uh, plutonium than, uh, uh, than they used. So they, they viewed this as a closed cycle. They never thought they'd have any waste. 
um, and on an island that's so seismic, where would you put the waste uh, at, the, at the end of the cycle? So institutionally, the Japanese have bought into this closed fuel cycle. Um, and uh, you know, Fukushima was the beginning of that fuel cycle. The, the burner reactors like Fukushima were the first part. Daiichi. The uh, Fukushima Daiichi was the beginning of it. The, the, um, the next part doesn't work. The Japanese have yet to get reprocessing working. And then the, the third piece of this is this um, fast breeder reactor. The Japanese have one that ran one year in the last 30 and had a huge fire. It's uh, cooled by liquid sodium, which explodes when it touches air. Uh, so they keep subsidizing this myth, the myth that they can close the cycle, um, putting enormous money into it. Yet at the same time, like Mark said, they're removing the subsidies from solar. Uh, makes no sense to me. Mark, could you tell us something about the METI, M-E-T-I, mm -hmm. and uh, their control of, uh, of the energy in Japan? METI stands for Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, and they're the most powerful industry in Japan, whereas, for instance, the, uh, the Environmental Ministry has not nearly the budget or the money. And METI nowadays is at least giving lip service to you know sustainability and they they you know the big new uh, word is smart energy smart grid but if you look carefully at what they're doing i'm afraid they really haven't changed a whole lot uh in, in terms of what they're focusing on and i th i think arnie's point uh, of what are you subsidizing and what are you aiming at is hugely important um so they, you know, I, I, do, I, I don't want to paint this totally negative picture of Japan, though. If I, if I could, I'd, li I'd like to kind of make a point. They're doing some really interesting things, and there are some very smart people there. There's a guy named Tetsunari Iida, I-I-D-A, who runs something called ICEP, the Institute for Sustainable Energy Practices. Did you meet him when you were over there? Did you? No. Yeah. I, I tried to, but we couldn't. We couldn't. Meet He's him. sort of like you. He's a former nuclear uh, engineer who got disaffected and who's become the gadfly for the nuclear in industry. And he has a plan for how uh, uh, renewable energy could take over from all other forms of energy by the year 2050 in Japan. Now, I'm not convinced that it can be done as easily as he, as he thinks without changing their lifestyle substantially. And I think we're going to have to change our lifestyles substantially in the coming years uh, because of global warming, because of, you know, I'm, uh, fracking is a whole other issue that uh, I'm unhappy with. But I think that we need to face the fact that regardless of whether we destroy uh, everything underground in order to get fossil fuel out. It's a limited time thing. We're not going to be able to rely on fossil fuel. At least our great-grandchildren won't. So what are we going to do? So, and there are some solutions. Certainly, you know, if I could just run down a little bit of the different things that Japan is facing. It's ironic that all of these nuclear power plants are by the ocean because they need so much water. Well, that's exactly where they could be building wind turbines. Um, they already have the infrastructure to get the, you know, if you put the wind turbines way up on top of a mountain, that's a problem because getting the electricity down from that mountain and into the grid is hard. They've already got the grid with all the nuclear power plants, so why not really push for wind power? They do have these you know, huge typhoons and tsunamis, so they have to build them very solidly. But Mitsubishi, for instance, is actually quite good at doing that with, with their wind turbines. Um, geothermal, he, the, you know, one of the reasons it's insane for them to rely on nuclear power uh, is that they're sitting on top of all these uh, faults. They have earthquakes all the time, which is how all of this started. Could, you, that, uh, could you just give us a brief... Uh, explanation of how geothermal is connected to the faults for our viewers. Sure. The, the tectonic plates are, are crashing up against each other 
and it allows the, you know, deep down in the earth, it's very, very hot. And so just a very simple thing, where the tectonic plates are coming together, where you have earthquakes, is also where you have geysers and hot things coming out of the ground all by themselves. So there's a lot of places where that's true. The, the example is Mount Fuji. <laughs> the yeah. symbol of Japan is, in fact, an active volcano. They have about 20. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but the problem is that about 80% of their potential sites are inside their national parks. So they're talking about, you know, they don't want to do that. I understand they don't want to do that. But if you look at the larger picture of things, I'm afraid they, they really should do, you know, allow some exceptions. To, to, otherwise, they're talking about drilling sideways in from the edge of the parks and trying to get it at the geothermal energy that way. Um, so they, they are facing issues, but uh, they're, they're things that they could overcome. I mean, I interviewed uh, a guy whose specialty is geothermal energy, and he told me that, you know, there were like 20 or 40 people, I can't remember how many, in his department uh, 15, 20 years ago, now there's something like three left because they've defunded them and they have no power. He can't make any decisions. Uh, so it's not like there aren't a lot of interesting things happening. The, the, the one other thing let me mention is um, their traditional way of building. Everybody told me, oh, the Japanese, they build like their houses will only last 20 years and then they tear them down. So they're, they're, that's why they don't have very good insulation. That's why they don't have double pane windows, things like that. Well, that turns out not to be true. It's true for after World War II. But they built very sustainably for hundreds of years uh, before being influenced by the West. And they're a form of housing called machia uh, that a few of them still remain, particularly in Kyoto, that have natural circulation in the summer that are pretty well insulated because they're right next to each other uh, one direction. Uh, and their sort of clay and wattle construction isn't bad. So I actually went to somebody's house, which, uh, a machia that she had renovated, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful place, and they could be doing this, but instead, they're building these monstrosities called, quote, mansions, which are condominiums uh, with very little insulation. So they continue to, to, you know, one thing they could do would be to have something like Efficiency Vermont, which comes in and tells you where are you losing energy in your buildings, and this is how you should, and, and they subsidize that here. They should subsidize it there. They're very good in Japan with uh, energy conservation for big business. Uh, like Mitsubishi they, Heavy Industries and Toyota? Like many, uh, mo or like the paper industry was a terrible waster uh, of energy. Mm -hmm. And they realized that they had to do something about that following the energy crises of the 1970s. But they've never addressed the residential area at all, as far as well, I know. Well, Arnie found that when he and our daughter went to Japan, it was so hot in any of the office buildings. It was 80 degrees yeah, and in the winter. <laughs> In February, it was 82 degrees in the office buildings. Um, I understand 82 in the summer, which was, but, but in the winter, they just had the heat cranked up. And in the summer, my understanding is they had gotten very accustomed, like Florida, to, to very heavy air conditioning of very cold. You needed to put on a sweater then. You have to reverse that paradigm, put on a sweater in the winter, dress warmly, and dress lightly in the summer. And, you know, change that paradigm. I mean, it's a huge, and insulation, as you're saying, in those buildings would make a huge difference. Well, you know, one of the things I've, you know, they have something now called cool biz. I said, what does cool biz mean? You know, and they spell it in English. Um, it turns out that it means that, oh, we're not going to turn up the air conditioning so much in the summer, which is why it's so hot when you went over. Um, and we're going to let people not wear coats and ties. We're going to let them wear short sleeve shirts or something. But that's not a long-term solution. Well, they're, they're channeling Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter's put on your sweater yeah. from the 1970s. <laughs> well, when Arnie was there, it was February. And it, they had it 82 oh. in oh. February inside. And yeah. it's 
way too high. Way too high. And, and of course, you know, the, <laughs> the image everybody has of Tokyo is incredible lights on the streets. You could you could read a book if half the lights were blown out. You could still read a book on the streets in Tokyo. It's so incredibly bright. Um, I just wherever I went, I saw waste. And um, uh, I, I feel bad. I mean, certainly as an American, we have no right to tell these people that they're they're wasting energy, and we're not. I mean, America's per capita energy consumption is worse than uh, than the Japanese. So we wind up in a situation where you wind up preaching uh, to someone who's really doing a better job. Yeah, I saw the same thing. I mean, you go in Tokyo and you see these gigantic television screens up on the sides of buildings. You walk past pachinko parlors that are incredibly loud and the lights are going off. And this was, this was two months after the disaster. And I thought, you know, you could certainly, or they have vending machines for everything all over the place. And they're a tremendous waste of energy. So they do that. Can I show, uh, I have a problem, I have this huge PowerPoint that I brought and I realize it's going to take too long to go through the thing, but I wanted to show a few select things. Oh, I would, we would love that. Yes, they, please do. They told me that if I told them to show it, that they could show one. So okay. I'll just periodically, that's why I'm fiddling over here. I'm, it's not like I'm not paying attention. <laughs> but can you show this particular one? Um, I went to, uh, they have the, an eco model city program, which I found they had instituted in 2008 because the G8 summit was being held there. And they basically wanted, it's a window dressing program, unfortunately, by and large. But some of these towns really were taking it seriously. And one of them was Kitakyushu, which is sort of like what Pittsburgh used to be. It was their big steel town. And I was impressed, you know, with, with uh, what they were trying to do. And one of the things they were doing were these electric bicycles. And you can uh, check them out from anywhere in town for very little money. And their, their batteries are charged by this range of solar panels that's on top. So it's a very sustainable way to get around town. And then you can trade them in in different places and uh, get batteries. And that's the kind of thing that uh, I think is very innovative and that we should be doing here as and well. And Mark, when do they start that? When do they start to, to rebuild the old steel city there? Oh, that's a great story, actually. Um, yeah. you, you must have read that in the book. Yes. It was in the 1960s. The women, the wives of the steel workers, were so distraught by the fact that they couldn't get the clothes to stay clean. They couldn't even see the sky. In fact, they, so they made a documentary using handheld cameras called We Want Our Blue Sky Back or something oh. like that. And this was the beginning of the environmental movement in Japan. And they cleaned up that city. You can, they used to, the bay there was called the Bay of Death because no fish could live in it. And you certainly didn't want to swim in it. Now you can swim in it and you can catch fish out of it. So they have really come a long way. And Kitakyushu has a number of very innovative programs. They have um, a recycling uh, area on, on a landfill. Um, they have a lot of wind power there on that same site. Um, but again, they're also doing some things I thought were not sustainable uh, because hydrogen is a byproduct of making steel they're, uh, they're powering a few things with fuel cells using hydrogen, but I don't see this as a, you know, it just happens that they're making this hydrogen. In order to make hydrogen artificially, you have to use a great deal of energy to separate, you know, if you're going to hydrolyze water or something like that. So they're doing some things. Oh, they, they, uh, they, had, they had me ride a bicycle, speaking of bikes, that was hydrogen powered. It was hugely expensive. I can't remember how much it cost, probably $50,000 oh for this bicycle. <laughs> and it was very, very heavy. And it was just silly. It was a toy. So those things. Oh, I'll tell you another wonderful story <laughs> from there. Okay. I, went, I went to a, uh, they have a nature trail. And I, they, they had a Segway machine, you know, where you stand on the machine. And I said, what's that doing there? 
oh, we have that for people who go on the nature walks. <laughs> Yeah. So they can ride the Segway. <laughs> so it sort of defeats the purpose of walking. Yeah. I love that picture in your book of the path of tranquility. That's so beautiful. In that, uh, I guess you can't I show that, that there. Yeah, I went to a little know. tiny town called Usahara. It reminded me a lot of Vermont. It looked like Vermont. And they have something they call a therapy trail, which is the idea is to take people who are mentally depressed uh, uh, and take them up to, into this beautiful area and walk along a nature trail. It's true. I mean, you know, we, we could we should start selling uh, therapy trails here on uh, tr for the long trail. <laughs> you know, the the role of women is is fascinating in Japan. We're seeing at um, uh, in Japan now. It, it's the women who have taken the forefront in weaning the country from nuclear power. Um, the men quite frequently are saying, well, the government says it's good, therefore it must be good. And uh, whereas the women who are, uh, you know, in addition to their personal concerns as mothers are worried about their, their children, have, uh, have, have taken the lead and, um, and, and are saying, uh, we don't want nuclear power. And if you look at the big demonstrations and all, certainly there are men there, and, and I don't mean to minimize that, but the, uh, but the movement got its momentum because the, the women in Japan have, have taken control. Um, that's um, significant for that culture because in general, the, you know, the, the women are not um, uh, expected to, uh, to take a leadership role like that. It's really exciting. Yes, yeah. and this past weekend, there, were, there have been enormous demonstrations of, uh, of support for the end of nuclear power in Japan. In Japan, the demonstrations have been in Japan and supporting, supporting, supporting that. Yes, yeah. yeah, and it's interesting <laughs> to see how the headlines or the media cover it here. You know, they'll say uh, the last nuclear power plant is closed down, and then they'll say, "But what about when summer comes? What about when the heat comes?" Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's always the caveat that this is not a good thing. And uh, I just want to uh, not to take a uh, a detour in in this, but uh, to to cite the um, editorial in today's New York Times. Okay. Um, the end of clean energy subsidies. Um, well, yes, yes. Uh, yet this productive. Uh, um, it's about how uh, nuclear is clean energy. Again, they're saying in this editorial that nuclear power is clean energy. What and they mean is that it's it's uh, not adding to the carbon footprint, but, but it's it certainly not clean. But it is adding to the carbon footprint immensely because in, in making the nuclear fuel, for example, uh, it's uh, Paducah, Kentucky, wh wh where one of the fabrication plants is is located and it's using the dirtiest coal that we have anywhere in the country and it uses huge amounts and huge amounts of fossil fuels are used in the mining process mm -hmm. and and none of that is ever figured in none of the waste disposal is figured into the cost of nuclear or its carbon footprint or how all of that's going to be combined in the equipment used to to take apart a nuclear site and uh, move the the waste and you know all, none of that is anywhere figured into the footprint and when you do their carbon footprint is quite high the um, the friend of mine is, is Peter Bradford who's a former NRC commissioner and uh, um, former chair of the Public Service Commission in, in, in New York and, and I think he sums up this the, the nuclear issue and subsidies and global warming the the best I've ever heard he said trying to solve global warming by building nuclear plants is like trying to solve global hunger by serving everyone caviar. Ha! <sighs> Very, very good point. Very good point. Okay. Yes. And, and your yeah. point about the carbon footprint is I've never heard that they expressed so succinctly and so well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I was thinking earlier and I made a note to bring the discussion back to here when you were talking about um, Japan's planning for the future and how they're looking that they can't do it without nuclear. 
Um, Dr. Arjan Makajani, who's um, right outside of Washington, D.C., and he founded an organization called IEER.org, he has a book out, and it, it's, it's free on um, his website. You can download it or you can donate to the website and buy it. It's called Carbon Free and Nuclear Free, and it's a road plan that he made it, for energy planning in the U.S. He's a nuclear engineer. He's a physicist. He's a Ph.D., and he was an energy planner in the Carter administration. And he knows his stuff almost better than anyone in the world. And he, he's, he answers a lot of the storage issues that you were talking about and transmission issues. Where, and you, I think what energy planners and engineers throughout the world need to do is get out of the box. Think outside the box. You have to start with, and this is what a lot of the women and mothers are asking for in Japan, start with a premise. There's no more nuclear because of the contamination. It's not worth risking children's lives. It's not worth risking um, inhabitable areas for generations upon generations. And therefore, get outside the box and let's, you know, the, when you look at Japan and you look at the U.S., these are countries who have been leaders in technological growth. Are they saying now, whoops, we've hit our limit. We can't, we can't think any new ideas and we can only stick with... Uh, oil and nuclear because and gas fracking because we didn't we can't think any clear our minds are dead now I I, I don't buy that premise I, I think it's fascinating the, the nuclear industry says we can if we spend enough money on it we can figure out a way to store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years but they're also saying well you can't have solar and wind because we can't figure out a way of storing the electricity right if we can store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million dollars, a quarter of a million years, we can certainly figure out a way of, of taking out the ebbs and flows in, in an electric cycle. And there are some ways. You know, you can, you can store uh, water in it. You can, you can pump water back up with renewable energy and then use it to create more energy later. There, there are some ways. I, but one of, the th one of the things you're saying, I, I, w I wanted to give the example of solar hot water. You don't need to uh, conserve that uh, because it's direct. The sun heats the water. It's the oldest renewable energy technology we have that, that's been around for a long time. In Japan, hardly anyone uses it. And I found this astonishing. The reason that they're not using it is it became quite popular in the early 80s after the energy crisis. And the cheaper varieties don't require a pump. You can just use water where it's temperate, which most of Japan is, where it's not going to freeze. Then they, you can see the tank on somebody's uh, roof, and it just circulates through gravity, and when it heats up, it comes back, it comes down, and, and it works very well. And what generates the pump? You, you, you don't need a pump for it. Oh, it, it, the hot it just, water is less dense than the cold water, so the, oh, the, it, the, the density difference. It, 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 it works fine, as long as your water doesn't freeze. The other type, the one that I have on my roof now, for instance, uh, you have to have an antifreeze in it, and you pump the antifreeze, and there's a heat exchange pump down in your house, which is still, it's a minimal expenditure. I love my hot water. Um, but what happened was... People would see the tanks, so you could see somebody had that, and, uh, quote, salespeople would come and tell people that they had to put chemicals in their tanks and do, f basically, they were uh, con artists. And they would particularly pick on elderly people who had these systems, so they got a bad name. And then a lot of these companies were fly-by-night and went out of business. So now nobody wants solar hot water because it's it's supposed to be lower class and you can't trust the people who who do them which is mind-bogglingly doesn't make any sense so in, in tokyo they're they're tr trying to give big subsidies for solar hot water because they know it makes sense but trying to convince people to have it is difficult so you you have all these image problems and misperceptions well when when we moved to Vermont, uh, when we lived in Connecticut, we had a house that was amazing. It had active and passive solar, and it was built in the 1970s. And it was in uh, exact same climate we're living in now because being near the lake, it's moderated, and, and we're in the same zone And because we're at the highest part of Connecticut, a mountaintop. And it was just 
I, during the day, I, I had to ask people if I was going to their homes or going out anywhere what the heat was because the house was always at 80 in the winter from natural sunlight, from this, and we didn't have water on the roof. It was a fan system and there was water storage in the basement mm -hmm. and then we heated our hot water with it as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So. Now this is not new technology. It's interesting, Union of Concerned Scientists has done a study where they looked at all the subsidies that have been put into nuclear um, over 70 years. And, and they've determined that if that, those subsidies would have raised nuclear's price by five cents. So the price of electricity from a nuclear plant is right now around five. It should be 10, except that we as, as taxpayers have subsidized the industry for 70 years. So um, you know, when I hear, well, you shouldn't subsidize uh, solar, we're talking about a, a new technology versus a 70-year-old technology. I think there's a role for subsidies on new technology, but when something gets to be 70 years old, you either got it right or you shut it down. Can I show another one of my little Of course, here? yeah, please do. This is a rice, uh, rice seedlings about to be transplanted. I got there in uh, early May, and so they were just about to plant their rice seedlings. Now, this just brings up a whole other issue of food. The Japanese import 60% of their food. They used to be totally self-sustaining, and they could be self-sustaining again. Over, I think, 40% of their rice patties are lying fallow. They're not growing anything whatsoever now. Why? Because after World War II, the American occupation convinced them that eating rice wasn't really that good for you. What you wanted was wheat and bread. Rice was old-fashioned. So they don't eat nearly as much rice as they used to. One of the things they could do with those fallow rice patties would be to grow uh, a strain of rice that's meant for animal feed mostly, but it grows very, very quickly. It doesn't need pesticides. They could make biofuel out of it, but they're not. They're not doing anything with it. Um, let me just show you, let me just rip through this a second. This is the cedar that I told you about. Um, and this was at the home of this wonderful couple. This is my favorite part of my whole trip. Um, let me see if I can find a picture of them. Ah, there he is. Um, I had seen this couple in a documentary film made about 20 years ago. And uh, they were struggling farmers but they were hoping that their son, who was 15, was going to take over. Only he didn't, it turns out. I, I sought them out to make to find out what had happened. He's gone on and taken a job in the city. He got a degree in agriculture, but he's an agricultural bureaucrat. But now he has a 15-year-old son, and they're desperately hoping that he will take over this absolutely gorgeous farm. They are self-sustaining. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's just a portrait of... Uh, of what is possible. This is, by the way, a hydroelectric plant, but it shows how str that they really, they see the big tank up there? The water is coming from a river on the other side of the mountain. They've drilled a tunnel through. It would make, so there's a lot of things that don't make a whole lot of sense about what they're doing, not just nuclear. But at the same time as you would write that that doesn't make any sense, you marvel at the fact that they drill that tunnel and their their expertise in so many in so many uh, technological oh, yeah. things. They're amazing. So that, uh, so if they can drill tunnels for that, they can certainly drill it for geothermal energy. Exactly. And that's uh, one of the major points you make. And well, addressing the question, does Japan have a nuclear free future? I'm going to ask you to come back again if you would please mark would you agree to come back again and uh, and oh, uh, and continue back. this conversation and arnie and maggie please of course do. yes but uh, could you you go to the ironies that you had written about in your book so that uh, we haven't answered this question completely does does japan have a nuclear free future i for one and the public who are watching i hope so and from what i've learned today and from the book 
I, I believe that it, it is possible that, uh, that it does. Well, one so. of the things that touched me and, and why I, I love Mark's book so much is he talks about how Japan can be a leader, yes. a world leader. And, you know, that's, they're on the cusp, that's the tipping point, that they can do something. And, you know, one of the things that's been so frustrating for me about this book is it's not available in Japanese. And Arnie, you brought you brought it over to your publisher, and I hope that they'll take a look at it. I haven't heard from them, um, but I desperately would like to get. It's a very short little book. If somebody yes. in Japan is looking at this, <laughs> well, the, I'm going to hold it up too, and to show people just just what it looks like. I'm holding it in my hand, and I've I've been reading it on ebook myself and enjoying it very very much. But this is the book itself. It's a small book as they say in the back, on a huge topic. And um, the, well, the fact is that this book has not been reviewed in uh, the major uh, book reviews that I read all the time, like the New Yorker book reviews, the New York Times book reviews, the London Review of Books, the New York Review of Books. Where are you? Where are you people who would look at this book and to uh, learn something for uh, w with all of us? It is ironic, um, you, you know, know, they had the, the uh, the anniversary of the tsunami and of the meltdown. And I listened carefully to the news and I read the news. How much did you get interviewed for that? Hardly. <coughs> Hardly, Hardly at all. Yeah. No one called me. It's very bizarre. Yeah. You know, well, it's interesting. Go ahead. No. Our, our, our book is, is titled uh, uh, Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth, which is a discussion of the accent, and The Way Forward. The last chapter of our book talks about energy alternatives. And, and here's Mark, five miles away, and we don't know each other's book is in the, in the process, writing about the same thing on a, on a much larger, larger scale. I just think it's, um, it's amazing that here in Vermont, we can, with clear eyes, look at, uh, look at Japan, and, and by reference, the United States, and realize that the system we have now is unsustainable, but there is alternatives. Yes. Well, thank you so much for You're being welcome. with me, You're Maggie so and much. Arnie. And Mark, come back again, please. We'd and, love to. Uh, the books have to be trans. One has to. Your Mark's book has to be translated into Japanese, and Arnie's book has to be translated into English. Yes. And we'll move forward into a nuclear-free future. Thank you, viewers, and thank guests for coming. Goodbye for now. Thank you.